So welcome everyone to Leadership Insights. We're joined today by Michael Finnegan, who's the founder of I2I. And I2I enable organizations and individuals to hit their objectives, maximize their potential, and to clearly understand the psychological strategies that lead to success. So Michael's been working in this field since 1992, working with the corporate, public sector, and sports industries with clients all over the world. And he's been very quickly established as the go-to specialist to lead and deliver positive change. And his clients include people like the NHS, the Army, the police, O2, Vodafone, Spy Hospitals, the Hollywood Bowl, and, and, and many, many more. I'm, I'm sure we'll hear lots of stories of those in our conversation today. So welcome, Michael, and thank you for joining us. Vikas, it's an absolute pleasure. It's long overdue was meeting, as we were just saying. Absolutely. It's one of those funny things about the business world. The business world is surprisingly small and surprisingly wide simultaneously. So it is. I'm glad we've got to connect. We'll have a lot of mutual mates, that's for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I, I guess j jumping straight in, you know, you trained under the kind of great W. Clement Stone, you know, an in incredible leader and philanthropist, right? But what yeah. were those kind of key learnings that you took from that incredible period working with a great like that, that sparked your career journey? Yeah. Well, this, listen, this is not, I, I didn't know you were going to ask that. This is not a plug, uh, but I have written a book about it because there were so many, you know, when you work with people like that, it, it's, they're full of it, aren't they? Every every day, every, every story is, it comes out, you know, so I actually wrote a book and, and, and I called it the people genius of a billionaire. That's oh. what I, you know, that's what, that was the subtitle. I called it tablets of stone, the people genius of a billionaire. And that's what I learned. If I could put it into a nutshell, I guess what I learned is people genius. Now I'm, I don't, I'm not saying it's all rubbed off by the way, cause <laughs> it hasn't, but it, it shone out of him and it shone out of him in a way that I have never seen it in anybody else, even wow. close, not, not even close, not even 10% of him. And I've worked with some brilliant leaders, but I'll tell you what, he was off the charts as a leader. He was just so, you know, if he, if he, if you work for him, Vikas, he would know you, he would know all about you. And yeah. his goals, as far as you were concerned, were sublimated in, in place of yours, you're, he was only interested in making you succeed. Wow. And he had like 60,000 people who felt like wow. that. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> no, that's who incredible. do you know who's like that? L L not many, Nobody. I tell you. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody. And I think th this is the really interesting thing for me, because, you know, when you, when you meet people in business or in high-performance careers, you know, everyone says, you know, we want to succeed, we want to win, but... But success is actually a surprisingly nebulous thing. You know, through, through working with these businesses and incredibly high performance people, you know, what have you learned about what success actually means and why it's so important for us to understand what it really means wow. to us? Because I've, I've seen so much of it and you're very kind in your interview there, in your introduction talked about all the different uh, people that we've worked with, but we've done this in, in 27 countries now around the world. So our, our world's a bit like yours, you know, airports and, and lots of different cultures. Yeah. And, and you see lots of different definitions of success. I was watching a documentary last night called The Edge about the England cricket team getting to world number one. And, and I'm sat there screaming at the television because listen, they set out to be world number one and they got to world number one, but the human cost was massive. Mm. massive and once they got to world number one it stopped you know and it fell off a cliff very quickly after that so i think what i when i want to work with people in success i want it to be rounded so i don't want it just to be about the balance sheet or the share price or the numbers if it's at human cost i'm not interested and yeah. i'm also not interested in it being short term i've seen too much of that you know where we mortgage the future to get to a short term share price goal or whatever it might be so I want it rounded and I want it long term and I want it nice and balanced in a way that where you want people to want to be a part of it. And I've seen lots of businesses where it's just about the financial number, you know, or a definite, a finite moment in time. And it's got to be more. W. Clement Stone wasn't like that. W. Clement Stone was about perpetuity. Yeah. W. Clement Stone was was about success for the individuals who worked here, the individuals who bought the goods, the individuals who supplied us with things you know he wanted it for everyone and there's some i think the world needs that right now more than ever doesn't it yeah absolutely you know, but but you see lots of people i've got lots of mates vikas and people i've worked with 
with, you know, eight or nine figures in the bank, but I wouldn't call them successful. Do you know what I mean? So I think sometimes there's too much emphasis on the, on the financial bit and that's not yeah. about it for me. It's yeah. more than that. And it's, it's interesting because I think over the years, you know, when, I, when I've had the pleasure of meeting some of these people who are kind of, you know, the outliers in, in wealth creation and so on, I don't, I've never met one of them who was genuinely motivated by money. It just so happened that they got fabulously wealthy, but they were driven yeah. by something else. If you want to go and yeah. be rich, go and be an investment banker. Um, <laughs> I think what, what, one other aspect of this for me was kind of, you know, you, you're obviously deeply involved in the psychology side of this. And in the last decade or so, we now know a huge amount more about performance than we ever have done. And it would be great just if you could share some of your insights as to kind of how far have we actually come in terms of our knowledge of oh, human performance? Blimey, you... Vikas, listen, I, ca I can't even tell you how far we've come. When I was knocking on the door of businesses in 1992, uh, saying to chief execs, can I talk about the psychology of success to you? There was like the, you know, like the black death, like, what are you talking yeah. about? I don't even, and they didn't eat, seriously, they didn't even know what I was, what I was calling for, you know what I mean? So you, you, were, you were trying to make a market. I've often said to my team, we were trying to make a market back then. We were making mm -hmm. it, you know, and, and I was reading books by the likes of Charles Handy at London Business School that was you know, 30 years ahead of his time. Yeah. So fantastic institutions and fantastic people. But the chief execs I was going to see weren't reading those books. They, they just didn't. I don't think chief execs yeah, yeah. read books 30 years ago. Do you know what I mean? And I was, I was fortunate to go to Ashridge in the early 1980s. So I was steeped in self-learning and development. Now it's much easier because everybody realizes that as a leader, you have to develop and you have to be aware that people make the difference. So it, I think it's come on leaps and bounds. I'll tell you what though, people still don't get it. Yeah. Now that's different. So even when people know the theory, can you now go and put it into practice? Do you want to? I've had, I don't know if you've ever had this Vikas, but I've, I've sat across the, the desk. I'm thinking of a guy right now, very rich man who ran a big business, you know, 500 staff in the Northwest of England. And, and I was talking to him about these things. And he said to me, he looked at me as if to say, oh, I didn't realize it was going to be that hard, you know, to work with you. He yeah. said, and he got, and he literally undid his office drawer and he took his accounts out and said, have you seen my balance sheet? Yeah. And I said to him, well, fair dues then, you know, carry on. So it's some, one thing having the knowledge, but can, can you really put it into practice? But we are in a better place than we were, let's yeah. say that. And actually, you know, I think one of the, you know, reading through, um, you know, what, what, what your, what your organization does, you know, it's that, that, that wording you use about unleashing the power lying dormant within, within the people of the business yeah. and thinking about that phrase, you see that so often where there is this massive capacity in that kind of cohort of employees and colleagues and businesses that is dormant. You know, why do you feel it is that so many businesses are failing to realize the potential of their perhaps most expensive assets? Yeah, it's a great question, isn't it? And, and you know what? I, th I actually think this pandemic is going to help us with that quest mm. of getting more of it into leadership. But I do think, you know, when we listen, we've all read the book, you know, Good is the Enemy of Great, haven't we? And that is what this guy was holding up his accounts, right? Saying, hey, hang on a minute, my business is broken, right? And, and you're like, yeah, well, that's what Good is the Enemy of Great actually means. And I think now in this pandemic, we're seeing that people can't look over everyone's shoulder. And we have to get, get in touch with a different side of our personality. We have to stop managing by the numbers. We have to trust people a lot more. And these are things yeah. that some people just don't want to do. They're just not comfortable with it. So I think we're going to see almost a genesis in leadership where people are going to have to get comfortable or they're going to be shown up. So I think it's just a reflection, Vikas, of the kind of people we've put into leadership positions yeah. who were put there because they were intellectually savvy and strong characters, but not that interested in people. Yeah. And not, they intellectually know they should be, but they're thinking, I can get by without being like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and as long as my boss will judge me on the result, you know, the bottom line, I can get away with it. So, so I think that's what's happened. I think this pandemic's taken a lot of that shield away from people. I think that's yeah. what we'll find.
But do you think it's also introduced in a different kind of language into businesses? Because particularly whether it's whether it's this particular pandemic, which many have likened to a natural disaster or, you know, other situations such as a, you know, a market crash. More and more, we're seeing that word resilience come into the parlance of, of business. And, and, and quite unusually, it's been a new addition to so many businesses language. You know, why has it taken so long for businesses to bring that word resilience in? And from your experience, what does that mean in terms of leadership and in terms of a business itself? Wow, brilliant. I think in the old world, Vikas, when we were all in an office, right, and we were all there eight, nine till five or whatever, it was easy for people to have kind of control, wasn't yeah. it? And, you know, you, you know, listen, I've been to, uh, you know, to, done lots of lectures where I've talked about the, the, the power of command and control as a leadership model. But because we're not together now, we're not physically there, and, and you can't make 50 Zoom calls every day to your team, you have to trust them. You have to get them to do the things they want to, that you want them to do mm -hmm. because they want to do them. So I think that, that, that isolation, if you like, has meant that there's got to be a shift there. Just give me the second part of your question again because I forgot what it was. Oh, resilience. Yeah. Resilience. Yeah. So, so, so in, in a way, what I, what I was thinking was you were saying is, and I think that under that system where we're all in the same location, if I'm the leader, as long as I'm resilient, I can drag you over the line with me, right? I can make it happen because we're physically connected. Mm. Now that we're not as physically connected, and we've always said this, we've always said that resilience has got to, our, our missions, our vision statement says inspiring greatness, empowering everyone. And, and we deliberately chose the word everyone. Yeah. Because only when everyone in your business is resilient can you have resilience. In the past, I think the, I think the location, the proximity, we say proximity breeds cohesion. So when you're together as a team, the leader can carry you over, your, over the line. When you're not, it's now up to each individual to do it. And what we're seeing in some of the hospital projects that we're working on with the NHS and with Spire is that now people have to be self-driven and self-motivated. Yeah. They have to get over those setbacks. They have to get over fear and tough days. And they haven't got somebody to look to who's going to give them that injection of resilience. It's got to come from within. So again, it's been a yeah. godsend for us because that's what we trade in. That's what we yeah. teach. And actually more and more now, you know, businesses are adopting a much more healthy attitude with, with, with remote work, with working at a distance. But one of the things which is much more difficult to maintain at a distance is company culture. And company culture and the maintenance of that culture is an important part of leadership. So what would be those bits of advice or insights you'd have in terms of how do we maintain and build company culture in an environment where we are all now distributed? Yeah, fan fantastic question again, Vic. I think there's a couple of points I'd make here. I think the first thing is, I'm just writing a, pay a, a note now for a client where we're ta I'm talking to them about, about, par about parallel uh, purpose, parallel yeah. purpose. And I think, again, we've got away without that. But... But now for me, I'm, I'm holding two fingers up here. If, if, if you are my boss, you, you have to know me. You have to know what my short, medium and long term objectives are. You have to understand how my values fit with yours. So you've yeah. got to manage me much more humanly and in a much more caring way. So you keep, us, you keep that culture strong by ensuring that, that the parallel paths of, of the organization of me as an individual are completely connected in that way going forward in the same direction. I think that's really important. And, and it's bringing, you know, the, the, the situation is bringing that skill to the fore. And it's a skill that people need a lot of help with. But what I also think is that, again, I'm meeting, a, I see a lot of leaders over the years, they're just not dead comfortable talking about a purpose like ours, inspiring greatness, empowering everyone. Now go and stand up in your team. And before you start your team meeting, talk about that for 10 minutes. Just talk about that purpose. Bring it to life. Talk about the lady in the canteen, as I've seen examples of, you know, where her photograph's on the wall because she lives the purpose and she lives the values. So I think just getting leaders, first of all, getting them to get those personal relationships and then getting them comfortable to yes. talk about enthusiastically with knowledge and with insight about the values, the mission, the vision of the organization. Again, we've got away with it. We've got away with it all this. We're not yeah. getting away with it anymore. If you're not connecting with me, I'm going to feel isolated very quickly. Yeah, yeah. 
So those two things for me are massive. Yeah. And then the other, the other big elephant in the room with leadership in particular is failure. And, you know, we see a big difference geographically, for example, in terms of how failure is thought of and handled in the US versus in Europe and the UK. Yeah, but massive, yeah. particularly in high performance careers, failure is inevitable. It will happen. Um, and we all have to bounce back from it, whether we like it or not. But in your experience, how can we train that kind of resilience to failure into ourselves as leaders and into our team so that they don't feel as frightened of it and actually are able to bounce back and learn from it? Yeah, uh, Vikas, my favourite quote on that is 1964, right? 50 odd years ago, Thomas Watson at IBM wanted to double sales in 1965. Yeah. And at the, at the sales convention to hundreds of salespeople, he said, all I want you to do is double your failure rate. Wow. He didn't talk about doubling sales. He just said, all you've got to do is, can you be half as successful as you were, please, yeah. this year? Just go out and double it. Now, so, so what I'm saying there is this, and I've used this kind of thought a lot. There's a lot about contextualizing it with your language and the way you talk about it. And I, you know, I can't think of any any area in the world where you don't on a daily basis, you and me included, meet failure. 90% of the people I talk to don't want to deal with me. So that's a 90% failure before you've even started. 90% of customers don't want to speak to you, don't want to deal with you. So I think we've got to contextualize it and realize that success is 90% failure. You won't catch yeah. me saying, for instance, um, trial and error. I'll talk about trial and success. Now, I yeah. know that's only a tiny thing. But I want leaders to use those things in the language to just make it plain. Listen, we ain't going to win every time, but when we do, we're going to win big. I think Branson's been brilliant at that over the years, by yeah. the way, you know, about putting it in the right language. Sorry, I can see you dying to comment on what I've said there, but it's a great question you've asked. Yeah, and, 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 it, and it also highlights one of the big myths of leadership. And we, we see so often that, you know, individuals might build a successful business and they are the leader, but... They're, they're a leader by virtue of having started the business, not because they are the most qualified person to do it. And I think one of the questions that I had for you is, first Great of point. all, how do founders get that introspection to know that they're not the right person to be in the chair? And secondly, what do people need to do to educate themselves to be qualified to be in that chair? Oh, nice question again. Listen, I think first thing they need to do is, spend time at masterclasses, you know, like the ones you've run. They should be listening to you and they should be listening to, I don't know, Chris Oglesby, you know, and, and Mark Adelstone and people like that. And then reflecting on that thinking, wow, where do I score it? If they're the best, where am I? So they need to open their, you know, just get their antennae up, open their eyes and just, and just plug into inspirational people. And then when we're coaching people a lot, Vic, I said, I don't know how much you've done of this, we do a lot of uh, independent psychological assessment of people. And when you do that, it's brilliant because what it, it takes the pressure off because what it says, listen, you're 50% brilliance and you're 50% susceptibility. So let's work on that. And once you've, once you've got some, a big quality of leadership, and I think, again, I think it's coming out at the moment, is integrity yes. and, hum and humility. You know, there is nobody out there is the finished article. You know, you look at a Chris Oglesby or Mark Adelston, they're working on themselves. And what they're doing is they're putting a team around them who will compensate for those weak areas and being brave enough and humble enough to say, it's okay. So I think somebody has to switch the light on because you've got to switch the light on in people. And that's what I, why I love getting involved with a masterclass because that's what it's doing. You're taking the pressure off them not to be perfect. We don't want you to be perfect. We want you to be brilliant. Those two are two completely different things. Nobody's perfect. Yeah. And, and what's the role of mentorship in this? Because again, looking at our colleagues in the US and you know, people often look at the components of why have businesses in the US outpaced their European counterparts? And it is not simply a function of market size. It's a function of approach to leadership. Yeah, and one of the things that U.S. business leaders do much, much more often than us in the U.K. and Europe is A, coaching and B, mentoring. And it'd be great to get your views on why those two components are actually so critical for leaders at all levels. 
Yeah, Vikas, I've I've spent a lot of, a lot of time working in. Um, I mean, it's probably now five percent of my time, but working as an example in elite sport. But you'd mm-hmm. see it with chief execs at the elite at elite level, and they're surrounded by a lot of sycophancy. They're surrounded by a lot of people who just tell them they're wonderful all the time. Yeah. And actually, the role of the coach and the mentor is to say, well, maybe you're not, and maybe that's okay. You know, maybe that's all right. <laughs> But, but if you, and, and you've got to be able to build that connection with people. So I th- again, I think the chief execs that we'd have most uh, success would be the ones who have genuine humility. So what I'd say to leaders is be humble. What you're going to find out is not going to terrify you any, any more than it's going to ter- terrify you or me, because you are going to be 50% brilliant. That's the way we're made. That's what, you know, we were put on this planet as. But you're 50% susceptibility and you've yeah. got to get inside it. And if your goal's big enough, if people really are ambitious to build something amazing, then that should be, for me, the driving force that says, okay, then, well, in that case, that self-reflection is worth it if it's going to help me get to there. But, but I just think people need to have that little bit of time. You called it introspection. I think it's a great word. And, and then, you, as the coach, you know, we're, not, we're not all fluffy as a coach. We'll, you know, we'll point out the areas where we need to improve. And we want to see you seriously devote yourself to making yourself better. If you do that, we're going to be okay. Amazing. And one kind of roundup question, if I may, uh, if, if I may, which is, you know, a lot of people will be watching this, you know, making notes and thinking about what they can apply into their businesses. But I'm sure that as you're going into businesses in particular, there will be certain traits that you see across businesses where certain things usually are not done well or done done right. You know, there's those low hanging fruit to to borrow the phrase. Yeah. What are those? So, so in all of our business, when we go back in, what are those few things that we should be immediately looking at if we want to improve performance in our businesses? Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant question again. So let me. We have a <clears throat> a little model here that we say has got five aspects to it. So number one, we see. In terms of, of uh, a vision, mission, va- vision and mission, people don't understand what they are. They don't understand what the power of something um, inspirational is. So, so first of all, make sure you've got a vision statement that inspires me to want mm-hmm. to find out more about you because of the kind of people you sound like, right? So, so it's hearts and minds, really. Get me excited about you as an organization. The second thing, then, is the clarity that comes from a mission statement. This is what we do, okay? And, and, you know, in our case, we are, our mission, leadership and development partners. That is what we do. We don't do anything else. So absolute clarity around the, the emotional vision. So why should I want to be a part of you? Now clarity about what we do. So what we do and why we do it. I, I then see values that just don't make any sense. So once you've got your vision and your mission, clarify your values, We've got, we've got our little set of values. It's only five, yeah. but we live by them. I went to a, an engineering company, 1,500 people, 26 values, Vikas. Wow. 26. Well, good luck with that, right? Yeah. The share price was good. They were doing well, but it was a rotten organization. The next thing is take the time to find out about me and what I can contribute. And then make sure that what you're asking me to do on a daily basis plays to my skills. Give me what's often called mastery and purpose and autonomy. So give me a round, put me in a round hole if I'm a round peg. And yeah. then the fifth thing is, tell me how I'm doing and tell us how we're doing and give me the tools to succeed. So if you'll just do as a business, those five things, vision, mission, values, round peg, round hole, and regular communication, that's what I see all the time that will make a massive difference to any business, no matter how big. Amazing. Michael, no, thank you so much for spending your time with us today on Leadership Insights. It's been fascinating. It's been inspiring. And I'm looking forward to listening back to it and making notes to go and talk to my board about in terms of what we could be doing better. And, you know, your career journey has been absolutely fascinating. And it's an honor to have you with us today. So thank you so much. It's been a privilege, Vikas. Thank you for your time.